Paul. Um, so thank you for being uh, with us tonight for the uh, 2023 John Cavell Lecture on Dead Society Studies. So those of you in person, we really appreciate you guys being here. And uh, those of us, you know, our friends and relatives that are joining us live stream, hello. Thank uh, Kyle Finley for your kindness and assistance in always helping bring this performance uh, remotely to our friends and relatives who could not be with us. So you've always been really great about that. Um, as is the custom and protocol of our community, before we begin the event, I'm going to invite my good friend and professor emeritus, Dr. Denny Smith, to open things up with a short opening address. Dr. Smith is a citizen of Fort Peck Assiniboine out of Montana. So thank you, Denny. Good evening, it's good to see you. Denny Smith, a magia. My name is Denny Smith. Nakodani Hinkna, Udeshabi. Je Wacha Hinkna, Fort Peck Assiniboy, and Sioux Reservation, Montana. Udeshabi. Je Wacha. I'm a, as Dr. Desanti mentioned, I practice this one, I had to say. I'm a citizen of the Sinai people, Sinai tribe in Montana. I'm a member of, uh, of the Red Bottom Band. Chajemi Tawa, Omni Washte. My tribal name, my Sinai name is Omni Washte Gudiko. And I don't share that, but I, you know, I need to share that tonight because I've been taught that when, I, when we talk to the Creator, when we pray or in ceremony, he knows us only by our name, and that's my name, so that's the name I use tonight. So I share that. Uh, it's an honor for me. Uh, I think of myself as a young elder. Some people think of me as an elder. I have a hard time with this concept. And, but it's always an honor to be asked to do this. And it's a great honor in memory of John Trudell. Uh, uh, I need a son. It's to have this lecture annually in this manner, this great man. It's, it's an honor to be participating uh, in this. Now, in the cultural tradition, um, the people who order in us, they're the people that are considered to be wise. And I'm not probably the oldest person here, and I'm honored to be asked, and I'm happy to do that. I apologize that I don't belong speaking because I'm not old enough to have that kind of wisdom. And the second thing is, I've been working on my tribal language for a long time, and I've been taught by the person that constructed our language force uh, beginning in 1983. I've been at this a long time, but I'm just starting, a couple years ago I decided I just have to try to do better, so I want to apologize to you. I'm, I give this my best shot in, in my language. I'm very happy, I'm so excited to do it. I might struggle, slow down, stop, it's going to be okay. So I say that uh, just uh, in, in a good way. So um, I'd you do this prayer, and if you're able to stand, we ask that you please stand. Oh, oh, Oshitagapa, Ungita, Ungita Kona Goop, Ne, Anthony Warrior, Hinkna, Dagubichia, Iuha, Iuha, Iuhana, Wachegia, Hinkna, Tinfugal, Hinkna, Dagubichia, Iuhana, Iuhana, Wachegia. Inkna upstream, no no was ungito or chekia. Inkna, Dr. Desanti, Inkna, you are now Ustbekia, Iuhana Nechi, or chekia. Inkna, or Yama Vichasta, Iuhana, or chekia. Uh, 
Studies. I'm a citizen of the Lakota Ray Ojibwe tribe out of Hayward, Wisconsin. And I also have ties to Bad River Ojibwe in Wisconsin. I've been at, uh, with you know, a long time, first as a student from 1997 to 2002, and now as a faculty member. I'm going to offer up a land acknowledgement, uh, one with the understanding that all universities must continue to strive to increase Native student recruitment, meet their needs, build responsible courses for them academically, assist them financially, and increase full-time Native American faculty membership. On this occasion, it is appropriate to acknowledge that the UNL occupies the traditional treaty lands of the Omaha and Oto, Missouri, and tribal nations. We'd also like to express our respect to the Ponca tribe of Nebraska, the Winnebago tribe of Nebraska, the Santee Dakota tribe of Nebraska, and the 170 plus other tribes that are represented within the Omaha area. It's an honor to be with you this evening for the John Trudell Lecture at Native American Studies. This is our second Trudell Lecture we've been able to hold since the pandemic began. Our Native Studies program started in 1992, and we are very proud and so very fortunate to have such a wonderful student body and Native community. We have stellar faculty representing a wide range of disciplines, such as history, religious studies, federal Indian law, tribal nation building, English, anthropology, gerontology, global indigenous studies, archaeology, medical humanities, political science, and public administration. I am proud of our faculty, and I'm particularly proud of the resiliency of our Native student body. Intertribal Student Council has stuck together and done wonderful things despite the pandemic and the hardships of the last three years. Uh, and I really appreciate Cornelius, who did such a great job at the powwow with the assistance of other people in the community. And Cornelius has been very, uh, and Cornelius has been very helpful with keeping the students together, and, and he's been very helpful to Native Studies as, as well. Tonight's festivities would not be possible if not for the generous assistance of the Goldstein Center for Human Rights and the Goldstein Family Community Chair in Human Rights. We also appreciate the support from the College of Arts and Sciences, the History Department, and the Religious Studies Department. I also want to thank the Native Studies Office Associate, Gary Saul, who always helps with the paperwork and the arrangements for our events, does a great job in the process. I'd like to thank Dr. Susanna Haliga, who teaches for Native American Studies and is uh, in the History Department. Uh, she deserves a huge thank you for encouraging us to bring Anthony Warrior in for the lecture this year. Uh, she was bringing us up uh, over a year ago, and it's, it's turned out wonderful. So she helped us introduce, introduce us to Anthony, his work, and how important it would be to have Anthony serve as our guest this year. So it's my honor to turn this over briefly to uh, John Trudeau's brother, Tim, to say a few words. So uh, I really do uh, do appreciate that, and, and 
really looking forward to tonight's uh, talking. Uh, indigenous chefs like Anthony Order, they're, they're doing a wonderful uh, job in bringing back the traditional foods into our lives. Um, and you know, I've I've, uh, I've done I've tried my hand at uh, making some of those meals, and but and each time I do, I, I do somehow I feel a connection back to our ancestors. So um, I'm really looking again, looking forward to tonight. Um, Anthony and other chefs, uh, they've cleared the path to our past and. Uh, you know, we appreciate their dedication to uh, the traditional dishes. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, again, I'd like to thank you and know, for uh, tonight's event and for continuing to honor John's legacy. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Tim, and the Trudell family. Um, and thank you, Matt Osborne, for uh, you know, being a great custodian and, and caretaker of the Eagle Staff. Um, tonight's lecture really does focus on health and human rights and the topic of Native American food sovereignty. And our invited uh, speaker is Anthony Warrior, who is a Kanju of Bat Nations on his maternal side and Absentee Shawnee Muscogee on his paternal side. Warrior has worked for 15 tribal nations, is a renowned chef who search, researches and shares traditional Native American recipes, stories, and methods of food preparation and preservation. In doing so, Warrior's approach to cultural nutrition helps to stimulate cultural knowledge, retention, and community healing. His work counters the harmful effects of settler colonial diets on native nations and tribes. And in terms of the order things, I'm just going to turn it over to Anthony here and let him kind of run the show from here on out. So thank you so much for being here and thank you. For say when you sit in a room full of doctors around here and watch them, you've got something going for you. So I appreciate this honor. It's, it's uh, a good feeling that uh, is uh, good feelings in my heart to be able to come and share something with you tonight. Now I know many of you have gone through your day of work, your classes, and uh, uh, I, I don't want to hold us up for too long before we dig into this food, all right? But I will tell you the journey down here from uh, by the Santi territory uh, was quite treacherous today. My, my pony's air conditioning ran out. So, 90 degrees with your windows up, going 70 miles an hour down the road. Uh, really seals in the flavor. That's what I said. <laughs> so, but we made it. We're here through uh, all of our struggles. And uh, on behalf of the uh, Omaha and uh, Santi, uh, uh, Winnebago, Pochunk people, I want to say thank you for this honor once again. And, and this evening, I also want to send my heartfelt condolences out to the Grant family, uh -huh. you know, on behalf of uh, that uh, that loss. And the way you say, uh, Tim Grant, you know, good uh, good words, uh, left a good legacy. So hopefully we uh, can continue on in that way. So without being talked up a little more, this is a passion for me. And this evening, uh, I want to uh, take you on a journey. So to start us off this morning, or this this. Uh, this evening, we're going to uh, say hello to all of our streaming people. We thank you for being on board with us too, and hopefully you take a little bit away from this also. So all of our all of our relatives out there, and our Nikanikan, all of our new friends, you know, we say welcome to you. Um, so I'm going to go about maybe six minutes, and the way we're going to do this is I'm going to start out, and I want to get us into a place. I want to get us into a, a way of thinking. By the way, can you hear me back there, Chris? Chris traveled a long way to come see me. This guy uh, promoted the heck out of me, and uh, so far I haven't let him down, so let's not start tonight, all right? <laughs> so, cultural connection, fantastic person, connects our inner city people with tribals across the, uh, the state of Nebraska. So he, he takes our inner city kids and kids that don't live in reservation life and reconnects them with their culture. So he's with the Cultural Connections Program in Nebraska. So we appreciate all his work also. 
discussing this evening, I want you to kind of understand where this food has come, where it's come from, and, and its journeys. So without further ado, each and every one of us natives, as non-natives, we, we, we have to think in our minds what it would have been like 200 years ago, 300 years ago. Just for a second, if you can, just kind of close your eyes and, and kind of take yourself back to that era. Take yourself back to that era. Kind of feel that, that atmosphere waking up in, in a village wherever you may be, and kind of hearing those sounds, seeing that community around you, feeling that, that fresh breeze, that hot air like it was today, and kind of understanding what life would be like for you to kind of wake up in that setting, to be able to see that community around you. And what is your worth to that community? What is your family's worth in that community? Where do you stand in that community? I know as a native, I've always thought about where I would have been, what, how would I survive? What, have been, what, what would I have contributed to my people at that time? And I think about that a lot, and even today. So when it comes to me bringing this environment to each and every one of us tonight, I want to take you on that journey to kind of take us back to the era. And then hopefully, throughout this journey of this evening, I want you to think about behaviors. I want to think about sustainability. I want you to think about the things that it's going to take for you to survive at that time. And I'll be honest with you, if anyone has went back to that time right now, I'm pretty sure most of us would not make it past breakfast. <laughs> so think about that as we move forward. And then as we're moving forward, I'm glad to see that there's a lot of our uh, our grandmothers in here, our nikia, our mothers. And I'm glad to see you know, our uh, home dog, our, our grandfathers here. Uh, because these words I'm going to offer you, I want to establish a connection again. I want to find that reconnect, reconnecting to where we need to be thinking about our families and our family's future. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and go into my next slide. Kind of give us an overview of what we're going to go into really quick. And hopefully this works. I tried this out all morning. So our <laughs> So, to start us off, our food pathways and spirituality. Some of the things we're going to talk about is the origins of the food. We're going to talk about some of the stories. We're going to talk about symbolism with the food and connectivity in that spiritual sense. We've got to talk about our four-legged four, wing, our four -legged and winged uh, family members also. The trade and commerce and the value of food. Our community values and what that food stood for and what we stood for in that community and what we offered as part of that food system. The planting and harvesting times. You know, going into the ceremonies and celebrations. Depression era and survival, of course we got to touch on that. We've glorified ourselves on depression food. And now, for us to come out of that, we got to think about our health and mental wellness. And then the end of an era, with that rebirth in mind of keeping us going, as we go into our villages and we're reestablishing that connection of 200 years ago of removal. We also look at the uh, rediscovering values, cultural, our own self-worth. Most people don't think about food as self-worth, and that's where we've really got to reconnect ourselves. What do we do as providers? What do we, what do, we do as nurturers? And kind of get that mentality back in our brain also. And then once we do, we get that vibrant and sustainable lifestyles that we're looking for, that we're yearning for, that we're needing, that these cultures today are really needing. And then genetics. You know, I've, uh, I've went through a lot of uh, John Trudell and you know, uh, uh, works. And, and he touches on all that stuff that I've researched over these years. So he kind of really taught about that as our tie to this land and to this earth. And so we'll go through that also. And the last thing is healing that broken circle. And what I mean by healing that broken circle is today's environment that we live in, we're broken. And we've got to find that way back. So that's how we're going to find out this resolution. After we get done with this, uh, this meal, we're going to go uh, into a little bit of lecture. We're going to follow it kind of historically, and we're going to go through a couple slides that show some good things. And then we're going to show these beautiful families that are living this lifestyle today, these people that I've come in contact with and been able to, uh, to get a lot of my knowledge and my experience. And, and if you see the, the passion in me right now, it's like I'm right there with them, and just that joy. So when you can see that, and I'm going to show you these joyful scenes. 
So not all tonight is depression. We're going to have some fun times too. So, but uh, that's our lineup for this evening. So I know we're off work. I know we're out of classes. And usually I talk until I hear the first belly rumble, and I haven't heard it yet. So, and uh, to be honest with you, I am very, very honored to be here. I've seen the lineup from the past. You know, uh, also uh, Mr. E Echohawk, you know, what a great guy. I've known him my whole life. Uh, and, uh, you know, also Adam Beach. <laughs> who's, who's more handsome? <laughs> I'm just saying, somebody was smart on the movies. i got to break that stigma, all right? But I will guarantee you that not one of them can prepare a meal like I can. <laughs> so, you got a bonus tonight, all right? Not only are we going to present, I also brought you some good food. <coughs> so, the next one here. This is our menu for this evening. A lot of these things we center in are what we source local, what we brought in. Uh, a lot of the stuff that I use today are actually 60% of our food offerings to the world came from here in the Americas. Did anybody know that? They yeah. reckon studies people can. All right. <laughs> so, but 60% of our, our produce and crops and food offerings we have today came from here in the Americas. And as Native people, that's something to be proud of. Okay? It's been altered, it's been modified, but those roots are still there, and that's what we're going to try to capture. So, with that being stated, I've been a chef off and on for about 25 years. My mother, back in the back here, she's here honored, and I want to honor her because she led restaurants from her whole life. She was actually here in Omaha, Girls Town, back in the day, and when Bishops was down here, she worked there. She actually worked in this student union in 1972. What'd you say you were, a foreign exchange student? No, <laughs> But she's from... <laughs> no, I hear you back there. That's my job. Hopewaka. And by the way, Hopewaka's name, Stomachissimo, uh, means when you hear a pack of wolves, and there's one that's the loudest. <laughs> I say, thank you, Grandma. She, she, she hit it right on the head. Um, so, without further ado, we're going to get you guys going through the line. And uh, per Dr. Brady, and per our co uh, customers, we want our elders to be able to uh, lead us out first. And if there is someone that needs some assistance, then please, one of us, help one of them out, uh, get them a plate, get them a little something. Uh, there's plenty of food. We prepped a lot, and I did bring some to go containers for you to take them home. So, we're going to have that. But for uh, your main course, in the first one, we have a bison meatloaf. 25 years of cooking, if I, as I have tasted native foods over the years, if you were to taste a native food 200 years ago, you guys would put them. <laughs> All right, so we, we had some seasoning. We had some, some cool stuff. But man, when you can go to, you know, uh, was it Charleston's? Yeah. And get a nice, you know, salmon. Oh, something different, you know? Yeah. So anyway, so I, I, I added my own flair on it, but it is uh, native food. So, we got the ground bison, and uh, got a dried berry compote on the top of it. I also have some little hope and yes, some little baby uh, potatoes, which are also indigenous to the Americas too. So if you ever seen a hope and uh, on on a tree, side, <coughs> you pull them up, and they're all they're about this big. They take about three hours to get soft. Yeah. But that's uh, they call it a tuber, a wild potato. So here in America, we have it. Uh, the three sips of salad. I got the grilled summer squash. I have a uh, three bean medley, broad beans. I got some lima beans that are all native to America plus some uh, cranberry bean, some uh, black cutter bean, and uh, we got some different uh, just beans thrown in there. I just scraped them up. I don't, I don't even know if they're beans. They're in there, all right? <laughs> <laughs> so we got the bean belly, and then we got purple hominy. So it's all marinated in a maple vinaigrette, all right? So it's kind of nice and cool. It's got a good flavor, and that's what you have in your wooden bowl there. Now, for your sweetness, because everybody likes a little bit of we got what we call uh, skipoki anana in our place, but uh, it's a... Uh, actually uh, pounded corn and they uh, make it like a cornbread, but it's boiled. Of course, we didn't have ovens, you know, big ovens back then and nothing like that, so most of our food was prepared that way. So I did it in that traditional method of boiled bread. So it's made with strawberries, and I'm giving a lot of, uh, a lot of honor right now to our uh, Six Nations and Haudenosaunee families because this is their spring ceremonies. This is their time of the year where they start their living. And through these quiet times that we've had, these hard times, as soon as we see those little white blossoms, that's when we know it's our turn. It's our turn to come alive. So that Thanksgiving starts now and works our way till the fall. So that strawberry grows bread, and I got wild berry wojapi, so the blueberries, the strawberries, you know, and really nice uh, pudding of the plains. And just on a bonus, it is thickened with arrowroot. So arrowroot is here on the plains. It was smashed and it was, uh, you know, put into a pulp and it was used to thicken soups. And it's real hearty, so if you ever had it, you're gonna have it. 
and then on the in the jug of the Six Nations strawberry drink. So when the longhouse is done, to open up the season, they have the strawberry drink on the on the uh, east side of the longhouse, and they serve everybody fresh strawberry uh, muddled with some maple syrup from the running of the, the sap. So that's going to be your enjoyable drink, and then I think that's water on the end, but I <laughs> that was here. So I, I didn't go for it. I was looking for gold drink. I thought it would be a little <laughs> uh, and for our, for our, our delicate Omaha's, right? So if you uh, can't have your uh, uh, bison, I do have some uh, walleye back there for you too. So, all right, Dr. Rudy, man, you're in good. You're in good with the crap. I appreciate all that you do for our people too. So right now, uh, I want to say uh, to each and every one of you, um, enjoy yourselves this evening. Go ahead and go to the line. My wife back here, my beautiful wife here, she's Sabano. Uh, and don't mess with it because her people killed Magellan. All right? <laughs> <laughs> Just be that. She's a warrior for us too. So. Uh, but more than welcome, our elders go ahead and start our, our journey through. We did put out a spirit play earlier, and I think before that, uh, we had that out earlier. So we, that, and then the prayer meeting, I assume, was for the food too, right? Okay. So we're going to take a little break. Here's what you have also. Uh, if any of you guys want to contact me, or if you guys want me for catering, or you guys want anything like that, when you come to your colleges or your groups, there's my information. So, we say, Benuela Tomoko means go enjoy yourself. So, I'll be right back with you. Yeah, there's extra. I, I figured I'd stop by sometime and pick one up. But. I got one for uh, Mark, who's he's, he's out, I don't know, Nevada or something now. So. What's wrong with the old one? <laughs> yeah, I, need a, I need an orange one, because I don't have an orange. I don't think I have any orange shirts. How are you doing? Well, we got a little break. Now's the time I try to hook up my laptop and see if it doesn't crash the whole system. It does that sometimes. So are they doing like a end of the year party sometime? Did I miss that? <laughs> I haven't been able to keep track of anything. <laughs>
Yeah, that's uh, not very fun. That's what I do for like a living. <laughs> I wasn't going for you, man. <laughs> You're I don't want to get a close up, you know, <laughs> straight in people's faces. <laughs> no, it's on you, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. <laughs>
never seen you in like a year now. I don't know. It's been a long time. Are you getting in line? Are you getting in line?
And so uh, by all means, enjoy your meal. Keep enjoying yourselves. The ones that are going through the line, I know you guys uh, can multitask and uh, a little bit too long. So that way we get out of here on time and matter. And then uh, once I get finished, I will have uh, some time for a Q&A. Uh, is our uh, online group back room going again? Or? I don't want to touch your mouth while we're sitting at home and not doing nothing to do with us. I'm going to cut this out for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, that way it gives time for you guys to ask any questions you want. I had an hour, but let's uh, pull that one off. Okay, so thank you once again for enjoying. I hope you guys have enjoyed your meal so far. And I just want to let you get that taste in, into, your, into your mouth and then let you know that as we move through here, just that fulfillment, fulfillment of that nourishment and knowing that it's, it's something sustainable that we need to get back to. So uh, let's continue on. So. For many of us here, uh, with the food ways of spirituality, does anybody here by chance know the story of the Sky Woman? E each one, each one of our uh, tribes, and we're not all the same. I'll give, I'll give you that. They're not all of us the same. And I know that when we start talking about native cultures and traditions, we get into this mindset of pan Indianism, where everything that we have is all the same. We're all expected the same ways, and it's not that way. We each have our own customs. But here, you know, uh, for more, many of our Six Nations people, including uh, others into the Ohio River Valleys, we talk about the Sky Woman, and then what had happened is she came out of the sky, she fell down upon the earth, and as she came down upon the earth, she was uh, informed to, to create life, to make life happen. So she commissioned the animals to go to the bottom of the uh, ocean while she sat on the back of this turtle and to get some earth so that we can begin this process. And so as she uh, proceeded to get this earth, she spread it over the top. And, and does anybody know who actually came back up with the uh, earth in their hands? Beaver. Muskrat. Muskrat. Yeah, it's a good delicacy too. I mean, the Mohawks love that, right? Muskrat love, remember that song? <laughs> All right, so as we're going along, you know, she spread that earth upon the back of the turtle. And as the turtle uh, was filling up and beginning to uh, do its part of creating this earth, um, they said she fell into the, into the soil after she she uh, came out of it, and out of her heart came tobacco. You know, out of her toes and out of her fingers came the, the strawberry vines. You know, and then of all of the things that, that she became offered to us was the corn, bean, and squash. And that's something celebrated as a staple for many, many tribes. And everybody's origins are all different about where, where corn, bean, and squash came from. So scientists, as we know, some of the fantastic science work they've done of uh, kind of map some of the ways that this corn has come to us. Uh, they got all kind of theories and stuff like that. But I'm going to tell you something. Previous to, previous to contact, our history is, is forgotten. It's not there. What happened? Where did all this come from? How did all this get across the continent? And I'll be honest with you. The ones who kept the most and best records for us were non-natives. Even today, although some of it's, and most of it's not factual, their interpretation of it is what we are finding today. We're looking at that, those origins. We're looking at those stories. And in your, as, as John Trudell said, in your genetic DNA, in your tribal DNA, you have that feeling that what these scientists are finding, there's more to it. You have to feel it. You have to be connected to it. And that's where we're at with our food source. So being back in that village 200 years ago, 300 years ago, that's genetics. That's thousands of years of genetics. And with our food sources, our food pathways, that's ingrained in us. We are genetically modified individuals to our areas. So where you were at, where your people or homelands were thousands of years ago, that's the food you know. That's the food that's in your body. That's what you came from. Your relatives were put back into that soil, were put on that soil, and through that, continuation of life, that nurture, all those four-legged, all those uh, winged people, all of our relatives, they were put back into that earth, and that earth continues its cycle, and that's through us. So as we learn, as we move along, we start 
noticing through that the three sisters, corn bean and squash, comes out of that soil that we came from. This mother, as, as uh, it's been said many times by uh, Crazy Horse, one mother, one earth, right? One earth, one mother. You know, that's uh, Trudell's, uh, one of his legacies, lasting one of his legacies from his uh, poems. You know, so everybody, not only us, but everybody in this earth was once tribal, has that tribal genetics. And through that food source, that's what we knew from our areas. So the three sisters for many of our tribes, many of us, including not only our gatherers, our hunters, we had these in every one of our villages. These were bases. We, we couldn't just live on being alone. So it's the base of all life support for all creation. And out of that 60% of our crops that are nationwide, it's worldwide now. These three sisters are nationwide. It's a reconnecting all of us, no matter where you come from. The symbiotic relationship of the three sisters, corn, beans, squash, they need each other, right? Corn grows tall, beans need something to climb. The uh, squash, she goes out like that, and she spreads the earth and she saves the soil. She keeps it nice and uh, moist, she preserves all that. It's a symbiotic relationship, and that's the same with all of us in the community. We have that symbiotic relationship. Each one of us have a part of this uh, life cycle. Complete nutritional balance. Our warriors are remarked in these books, in these analogs, in these, in these uh, historical documents of our warriors being able to be mobile in moments while we're waiting on all these other troops to gather in big wagons full of food. Many of our tribes, many of our people carried a pouch of cornmeal on their, on their belt and that could last them for days. That corn was so heavy with protein, with carbohydrates, it was a complete balance. <coughs> and that's what, we, uh, that's what we had years ago. Now we have all this stuff, sweet corn, it's, it's produced so quickly, we're missing all that. We're missing all that nutritional balance. But for one individual to be able to be on a path, on a hunting party, for days with just a pouch of cornmeal to survive, like I said earlier, if you were in that village today, we wouldn't make it past breakfast, all right? So keep that in mind as we go through here. The human and tribal uh, genetics, our attachment to that corn, to that squash, to that bean, it's, it's in our bodies. And when we take that out of our bodies, we lose who we are. We lose our balance. Our body doesn't recognize it. Our genetics doesn't recognize it. And we're going to get to that here pretty soon. So, and then uh, modifications over thousands of years being known to that food. There was a, a saying that I saw on a wall uh, a while back, and it was really kind of cool. It said, when you put out these feasts, you don't put out the stuff we have today. You put out food that your ancestors knew. That way they know where to come home to. That's what they tell us. And so when we have our feast, our traditional feast, our family feast, we put out that food that our, our family members know. My grandfather liked circus peanuts, so we always put <laughs> So <laughs> we're not all free from this. <laughs> and then fast foods, another part of our diet, all right? If you could run and catch one of these animals, you were fast, right? <laughs> this is our fast food before these dry foods, all right? These things could outrun you quicker than anything. And if we are the way we are today, we would not be able to keep up, right? We'd be terrible hunters, right? So, vegetarians, bad hunters. <laughs> so, corn, bean, squash. Now, this little picture on the side was one for one of our uh, tribal gatherings. Anybody can tell me what that is beside the corn on the bottom picture? Good, beaver tail. Very good delicacy. Fatty. It's got a lot of nutrients. That one beaver tail could feed a family of 10 people, right? It last all day long. Didn't need much. Overhunting, overpopulation. Kind of into that for us, right? And then that's venison cut steak. And that type of method of cooking is on a rock. So you eat your rocks. You know, some of you guys will throw water on and sit there, but you know, I put steak on mine. So that's, you know, that's our venison and these traditional ways of cooking. Uh, one thing to keep in mind too, when we cooked the way we did back then, close to earth. Anybody here been vegan before? Anybody? All right. So you can go pure vegan. There's nothing wrong that I did. But there's missing nutrient that you have to have for a vegan, and it's for cell regrowth. It's for your body's ability to be able to uh, rejuvenate itself. When you do not get that vitamin and you eat all vegetable, you will actually break down. Um, and now they got supplements for that. But years ago, when they heated that rock and they put that coal and that uh, ash around it, that was that vital nutrient. Not only that, but that wood ash that they cooked on, 
Today they sprinkle it in corn mush. They put it in uh, soups. It's uh, anti-cancer. It, it fights cancer. So when we cook that way, we have low numbers of cancer because of that alkaline and that wood ash. And that's what helps rejuvenate our bodies, keeps us going. So we are connected one way or another, chemically, genetically, and that way. So keep that in mind if you ever try to go the vegan route. So eat somebody's charcoal off of their smoker or something. <laughs> So, moving on along with the food systems, we not only <coughs> eat food, we were actually uh, use food as a sense of uh, food sovereignty as trade, commerce, monetary systems. Food was that important to us because resources through all people across this world, when one person is out of resources and the other person wants it, what happens? War, right? We go and try to take over. No matter what it is, whether it's food, oil, <coughs> this food system was very valuable to us, up and down these river systems. In fact, that's a map from 1703 that I found. And if you look where the borderline of Florida, where Spanish owned, and uh, where the uh, uh, Canada started, New, New France, if you look right about right there with the Osages, that's Oklahoma. And that's the uh, Can Canadian line right there. So. You Omaha's were in Canada. <laughs> you didn't know it, did you? It's on TV, you guys were in Canada. But a lot of those people, you know, they, they knew that. They knew that at the time, the one we were divided up, 1700s, pre-1804, 1804, uh, that were under our jurisdictions where we were. So everybody says, oh, we were once there, we were once there. Well, you guys could have walked across the street and you would have been in, in Spain, you know. But. So anyway, we talk about that, and these river systems were valuable. Yeah, has anybody been to Mitchell, South Dakota? Have you seen that food cache there? That when they unearthed that village and they look at those food caches? Oh, yeah, yeah. Did you guys see the artifacts they found? Most of that stuff was from South America. How to get into, the, into South Dakota, right? River systems. We had all of these trades going up and down for thousands of years, thousands of years. Pre contact. Anybody ever been to Cahokia Mountains? One of the big hub trade zones off the Mississippi River? Everything was traded there. My grandmother, who's in Muskogee Creek, once said that where the Gulf of Mexico was, there was no water. You could walk there back and forth. And that's what she knew from years ago, being passed out. So how our terrain has changed, how it's been over these years with these water systems, we have a fast and valuable commerce system here, and a lot of it was food trade. There was no way you were going to be able to plant corn in the middle of winter up north, so you'd better get it from somewhere, right? And each person in all these community villages knew their worth. They knew their corn. They knew their blue flint corn. They knew their Cimarron red. They knew their white flint corns. And when you traded that, that was a value because they knew it was going to sustain your people. So keep that in mind when we talk about uh, a value of a food. It's just not on your plate. Today, you don't even take this into consideration anymore. We don't have a respect. We don't have a connection. And that's taken. <laughs> They knew what I was talking about, right? <laughs> so community values, food, build community values. You woke up that morning thinking about what you had to do for your people. Where are you going to go take care of the crops that day? Was your family responsible for, for growing and producing some of the best squash, some of the best corn? Was your son one of the best hunters to provide for that village? Those are the values that we once had and we prided ourselves on. People would mark their lodges knowing that there was a good hunter there, a good provider there. They knew who to talk to. They talked to these clan mothers. They talked to these, these grandmothers that knew when it was time to plant. There was a value there and a wisdom when it came to food because if those crops didn't come in, if that knowledge wasn't passed on, your people were either going to go to war for those resources or your children were going to starve. And that's that work. Today, we go to work, we can get some money, we can go get our food. But back then, that's that mentality that I want us to start thinking about, because it's so important. Not all of us in here are going to be farmers. To be honest, when you're this big and you try to bend down, you get lightheaded, right? <laughs> I'm not picking beans. I'm not picking I picked peanuts for a little while, that's not going to work either. So. Moving forward with, with your, your value, your self-worth, your hierarchy, 
Everybody knew the hierarchy in the Psalms. We, we, we sing songs. We, uh, we, we wear our markings on us. And we're proudly displayed who we are, what we do for our people, how we provide. Community connection. When you had something that you grew, you grew proud of. Everybody knows when you got something good, you want to go share it with someone. Or when you, when you grow like as big as a king, you put it on Facebook, right? Oh my God, I'm a gardener, right? Miracle grow. Anyway, so uh, those are some of the things that we, we talk about when it comes to the, to the food offerings of our people and community worth. Rites of passage. Every time we have a doing, every time we have a ceremony, every time we get people into their hierarchical systems, into their family worth, we have meals. We provide meals. When you're born, you're given a meal. When you die, you're given a meal. And when you're, you're right to passage, you're given a meal. When you do something fantastic, you're given a meal. That food is tied to us in so many ways. And then building families. When you can sit down with a meal or with a family, historical documents, the Spanish documents, they're being deciphered all the time. All these Spanish documents, they're coming out, they're finding new stuff. And uh, I've got to read a couple of them. I don't speak Spanish. I, 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 I just kind of make up words, like my boy the other day saw a picture of a fish and a man with a hook, and he just made up this whole story. That's what I do with Spanish documents. <laughs> so, they're, they're talking about uh, when they came in contact, especially with the Osages, right at the Arkansas River. Those people, at that time, did not eat three squares a day, right? They also remarked about the amount of food that was consumed, a lot of teas. Sustainable teas, stuff you can find around you. A lot of things that you can walk out and find, that's sovereignty, right? Being able to sustain yourself off of that food source. Can you guys walk down here in this tree line and find something to eat? Some of you guys can come back belly sick, I know you will be. <laughs> but if, if, if these, these Spanish documents state that when they came to the villages, about three times in the, in the work, in, not the work, the whole week, and that Sunday to Sunday, three major meals were given to the village in a week. That's three major meals. That's when we all sat. That was usually when the hunters came in. That was when the mothers would come together and prepare a meal for the community. The rest of the time, it was that little pouch of cornmeal to sustain yourself. Believe me, if we had the spices that I used today to eat, to make with, we would have been some lazy people back then, right? <laughs> it wasn't for comfort. It wasn't for taste. It wasn't for flavor, it was for sustainability. If we went to that village and we ate three eight ounce bison steaks a day, we'd be on the road to go some bison, find some bison somewhere, right? Because we can't eat the way we do. If you had a village of 300 people and you ate the way you do today with what you've worked for all year long to sustain yourself, we would have no food within a month, maybe less. We did a, we did a couple samples in, in the village of Santee when they had the ice, uh, ice breakup and couldn't get in and out of Santee and the water shut down, we did emergency management to see how much food in the reservation could sustain our people and how long, how many days? Anybody remember that study? Six days. Six days of food. The way we eat now. Okay? That's a mentality. That's a behavior. We've got to start breaking that cycle. We've got to think about that. Whole bag of chips. It's always good to go home and strengthen and see your past and know you have some place to go where you are a part of the people. John Trudeau. Good words. That's your home. You respect it. You respect the people near you. And when you had a homecoming or when you went to other villages, you felt like home. And that's a work. That's a community standard. That's community and, and community values. Remember that when we go through these. So, that harvest time, ceremonies. Where's my Ada? Where's my Ada lady? There she is back there. Another fellow Oki. Uh, we celebrated food. When it came time for spring, if we plant it too early, what happens to that seed we save? It's not going to make it, right? Our people are going to starve. We had to know when it was time. There's things that we watch for. Amongst the Shawnees, in the springtime, from that fall time when we close out our season, we're quiet. We do nothing. We don't dance. We don't sing. We don't make loud noises. Because that's a respect we have. When it comes time for spring, they see the old ones. 
the creator, the controller of all. He'll show us when it's time. He'll send those little blossoms. He'll start turning those, those buds on those trees. He'll start seeing the specific grasses growing along the river systems. Those are what our people look for when they tell them, it's almost time. So in that springtime, what we do, before we even get going, we'll start in the heavens and we'll say a prayer. My grandpa Richard used to say this prayer and we, all of us kids would be like, sleep out there on the dance ground, you know? Because he used to start the stars and he would bring it all the way down. Everything that affected our survival, our way of life, it was a Thanksgiving prayer. The Mohawks have it in their museum up there. It's on the wall. It's not that long. Everything, earth, star, elements, and he'd bring it all the way into the earth. And then that's when we knew it was our turn to plant. The old ones, they, they turn it over to us. So we sent our hunters out for four days. Our women would start the bread process. They would start making our uh, corn, bean, and squash breads from the dried stuff from the year before. The woman chief would say, all right, we're going to dance. Get everybody in order, men and women. 12 men, 12 women, across from each other. Clans had to line up. The men hunters would go out for four days. The women would prepare the meal. On that fourth day, the hunters would come in. First thing in the morning, the women would be cleaning the ground. And they'd bring their hunt in. The women would bring their bread in. And then they would prepare the meat. And then they, right in the middle of our ceremonial grounds, I'm talking like way out in the booties, like bring a couple extra spare tires, all right? So they bring the, right in the center of the ceremony, they set the, the meat down, the men's offering. Then the women bring in the, the bread, and they put it right beside the men's, all 12 clans. And then they fold it up, and then we dance all day long, and we dance all night long, and then that next day they open those bundles with that bread, and they start distributing the meat and the bread out to all the people, all the little kids. That's a ceremony. That's not religion. That's, that's spirituality. That's your connection. Because you knew it was time. It was a celebration. We got to celebrate. And then from that point on, those next couple months, and then men and women, we get together. And we play this ball game, right? Like, it's like rugby, right? Men against women, who would love that? Right? <laughs> so these men and women square off east to west. So once that dance is done, these men and women, they start getting the corn ready to plant. They start getting the beans ready to plant. They start bringing the corn in the plant. And they do this in sequence. And these ball games are played throughout that, that season from when that first seed's put in the ground. At each end of the field there, there's two poles. And this is knowledge that's passed down. It's as wide as you're supposed to plant your Indian corn. That's your goal post. No wider, no shorter. This is how they measure because this shows you how wide that corn. Grandma used to say you used to crowd corn, they were like women. They start griping at each other. That's what she used to tell me. Keep the corn this far apart, that way they don't fight with each other. <laughs> and today we're finding that in gardens, in nature, when, when nature grows in its own natural sense, there's frequencies that bounce off each other and they know which is going to survive and which is not. So when you go on <coughs> that row of corn, you can feel that. That's your frequency, that's your connectivity. This is science that's working that our people knew years ago. This is indigenous thinking. Plant that corn that far apart, no more, no less. And when you walk it, it makes you, makes you feel good inside. So one thing also, as we're moving along the ball games, once they start that corn, these men and women play, with, play uh, against each other, and man, it's rough. They beat each other up. If you got something against your husband, you get out there and you take it out on them. That's the place to do it, right? So they, they, they play against each other, and if the men win, it's going to be sunshine, right? That's what they tell us. If the women win, it's going to rain for us. And our crops need that. And the crops love to see that. And we'll play that ball game week in, week out, until that corn gets there and it starts to toss up. Then they say, don't make no more noise. Put that ball away and leave it there. Because that's when they say, make the little Our creator is going to let, let that corn go. It's going to grow when you see that toss up. So then we finish up the year. And then we get into green corn ceremonies, right? When that corn first starts budding out, and then we take that first green corn out. Grandma always says, this is where it's most important. We are not designed to eat fresh fruit out of season because that's not when the Creator gave it to us. That's not sustainable. And you see the problems now of having agriculture 
12 months out of the year. Sustainable practices are not being followed. When you're able to have that feast and that first berry's ready to eat that berry fresh off the vine, that's a flavor you'll never forget. When that corn becomes green and it's ready, you start getting that milky sage, you bite that corn and it's got that sweetness to it. That's when the creator says you're ready for it. How many of you guys ever fasted before? You guys doing this intermittent fasting? Kind of rough, isn't it, right? But, but, if you've ever taken your food back to just the basic flavor of that food, that berry is sweeter than sweet without anything added to it because you've allowed your, your, your palate and your mind to recreate that taste and to crave that taste. So being able to get foods at the time it's given to you by the creator, that's rewarding. Now, preservation is the biggest part because you have to sustain a lot of that. Whatever you can dry, today we cheat, we got freezers, right? But whatever you can dry and sustain for your people through that time is what was going to last you till that next year, till that first berry came off of that vine, <coughs> till that first corn came off of that crop, and until you first roasted that squash in the fire. That was that flavor, that craving. Everybody talks about, oh man, I can't wait till we get melons again this year. Can't wait till we get peaches again this year. And we have to have a feast. We respect that food. We give it all the praise. We govern ourselves off of food. We live our lives for that food. And that's the most important things about these food pathways. Finding that, remembering that. Continuations of, uh, continuation of life, a spiritual sense, strengthening of tribal genetics. As these people begin to grow those squash, be able to make the best squash. They knew how to pick apart what was going to happen and what was not going to happen to be able to make the best and strongest crops available. We did our own genetics. It's not what we called it, but that's what we did. We picked the best. We kept it going. So that food is, is very important in that, in that direction. So many tribes, including many of these tribes up here, when we had visitors, we had social dances, we had things that we uh, like to do uh, to, to enjoy our times. There's also a general knowledge we have, too, of knowing which crops grew with each other and which crops fought against each other. Anybody here gardeners? Right? A lot of you, right? If you grow a, a big, tall, hardy corn and you put a bush bean by it, what happens? The bush bean latches on it and it pulls that corn down. So, and the other way around, if you got a vine, uh, a tall row, uh, a vine that takes off, those little stockier ones are better for those beans, right? There's a symbiotic relationship there and you have to know about it. So, natives had storytelling through song. That's what we talk about. So, amongst our tribes that we had that planters, gardeners, uh, the Navajos, the Nez, uh, the Creeks, Muscogee Creeks, the Haudenosaunee people. There's songs that they use throughout the year. And I, I do want to share one song with you. So if you guys don't mind, I got a little bit of a singing voice. Not much like Barry White. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but um, so there's sequences of songs that we sing. And over the years of learning and coming around and hearing these songs for the majority of my life, uh, I've come to learn that these were storytelling songs. And they used to say, sing them in sequence. Sing them, sing them this way. Sing them this way. You, you may forget one or two songs, but uh, if you can sing all of them in, in order, then that's what, uh, that, that's how it's supposed to happen. And there's a reason for it. It gets passed down through all these songs. <laughs> Shared governance. And 
Each one of those people in line, man, woman, man, woman, had a contribution in, those, in production of this food. In continuation of life, they offered something to their village, to their people. But this connection of these songs, so my determination, and I share this, I, I work with Iowa State, I work with UNL, I work with these other colleges when it comes to indigenous uh, thought processes. These natives put these songs in order, in exacting order, because those were how the planting should happen. When you have a corn dance, when you have a bean dance, when you have a, a wabiko, a, a pumpkin dance, they knew that those plants had to be planted in that order so they don't fight with one another. Who knew, right? That's kind of ingenious. We do it today like bookmark and you know, bookmark. But anyway, that's, that's that connectivity we have. We know we got to plant those in the right way, and that knowledge has got to be passed down. So working with uh, these colleges, Iowa State, working with the you know, UNL, trying to reestablish that, trying to find those connections of why those grew together and why they don't. And for the past five years, uh, one of the colleges that I work with actually is taking the soil health samples is actually taking, taking um, which plants work best with each other, which uh, variety of corn, bean, and squash, and they're, they're mapping it out for us. I'm not gonna say anything, they got the money. I'm gonna let them do it. <laughs> I could go out and spend my own money and waste you know, time, so. Uh, but the plant harvest time and ceremony, those are strong, those are strong in our way of life. That's our genetics, and it's in our heart, it's in our mind, and, and right now it's in your ears. I just planted a couple seeds in your ears uh, tonight, too, that you can let them grow and you guys can understand this. So, as we move along, real quick, I know we're running out of time and I don't want to keep going, but uh, these actual pictures come from a Jessica uh, Deedler. She works with the uh, Algonquian and uh, Woodland era people. So, those are all our homemade baskets. That's her harvest over the past couple years that she's done. And those are the variety of squashes she grows. An elder told me one time when it came around time for Thanksgiving or uh, for uh, Jack Lantern time, he said, uh, I have to tell you something. He said, We spent thousands of years of making something edible, and in the past hundred years, they made something inedible a pumpkin, right? They got the carbon it, you know, and they don't even eat it. We waste so much food these days. But the food harvest preparation and preservation, we have seed saving efforts going on. Those of you that'll be around next week over here at UNL, uh, I also get to be a part of the uh, uh, Center for Great Plains Studies. Uh, doing some food demo cooking over there, and also um, I'll be doing the meal that evening, uh, much like a wine tasting, uh, also at the Glacier Teal. So I'll be offering food there. But Pawnee Nation will be there. Pawnee Nation is coming up, and they're one of the indigenous people of Nebraska too, but they're seed saving efforts. They're, they're coming up, and she's going to share a lot of knowledge with you on that. Uh, we've been doing this since 1989 uh, with the Thakiwa Project with Sacred Fox Nation. Uh, we collected seeds from the whole Great Lakes area up into this area. We made trade with Kickapoos, Iowa's on the southern border. We collected seeds from all these people. Unfortunately, what happens whenever you get something going really good? Money runs out, right? So kind of a lot of these efforts have died over the years. Soil conservation, uh, eating seasonally like I mentioned earlier. Only eating when that food is offered for you. You know, fresh. If you grow it, you know it's your effort. I put that in there and establishing that respect for your food, getting back into that, of uh, knowing where that food comes from. We hear that a lot. Food sovereignty, right? Food security. <coughs> sovereignty is a big word. It gets thrown around a lot. But it also falls short of what it actually should mean. And that's one thing that we want to establish, is that thinking in that mind back then, when you were actually sovereign, when you had nobody to depend upon, that's kind of where we need to be back in thinking process, bring that, that term true. So now, 150 years in this area removed, one way to kill people is to take away their food. One way to take away, kill people is to take away their lifestyle, their commerce, their trade, their work. And this is the depression area. You guys seen this picture before? This is off, uh, this is off of Rosebud Reservation, right? So that's the, that's the ration distribution day. And what do you guys think are in those sacks, right? White flour. White flour, right? So we think about genetically modified foods that we once had, that we modified ourselves, and then being cut off. They burned our food, they took our food away, they killed our food. They starved us to make us conform. And then they give us those other foods that our bodies don't know. Our bodies didn't understand them. 
and 150 years later, we still don't understand them, right? We're still hurting. Introduction of non-ceremonial foods. I'm not going to dance around a sack of flour. I'm just going to I don't even care if it says bluebird on it, right? Uh, introduction of destructive eating behaviors. We, we had to feed our children, had to feed our elders, whatever we could get our hands on. And we just accepted that. We had to accept it. That was something that was forced. Not all tribes are the same. I'm not saying that. Some did very well during that time. Because they, they had their own regulations. They had their own assimilation practices. <coughs> But for those in this area, we knew what damage it was doing. And then interruption of self and community work. We had nothing to show anyone. We had nothing to, to, to prove. And I, I, has anybody ever seen a move Maverick with uh, Mel Gibson? So when he coming in and the, and the Archduke paid him to sing that, sing on the drum all day long, and they're all just kind of sitting there like, oh, no. and he says, what's going on? He goes, oh, we kind of came up short this year. We got to keep the Tom Tom's going, and so it's kind of what I think about during this depression era. You know, we just we kind of had to sacrifice a lot. But that was what we went through. And then up here in the corner, this is the new accepted USDA food guide. They got rid of the pyramid. Anybody know that? As a kid, we were told about the pyramid, right? You got to eat this, got to eat that. Twelve servings of grains. On this, right up here, in that blue dot, it's detrimental. That's detrimental to our, to our families. How many, how many children, how many of you have experienced problems with drinking milk every day? Drinking, eating cheese. We were not built for that, right? I didn't drink buffalo milk. I'm not going to go out there and try to milk one either. I <laughs> that was detrimental. <coughs> it still is detrimental. My daughter here and my son are told they have to drink milk every day at school. It's part of the USDA. A thousand years of genetics, and all of a sudden we have to drink milk. Man, nobody wants to be around me when I eat ice cream. I love it. But <laughs> drink milk. Nobody wants to do it. Those are problems we have with Somebody's telling us still how we have to eat. They still tell us how we have to eat. In fact, even though this looks all happy and stuff like that, they're saying three meals a day snack in between. What did I say earlier? They remarked us. We didn't eat three meals a day. We, we were told we had to clean our plates. We didn't need six ounces of protein at every setting. If we ate that today, we'd be out hunting. We wouldn't have any food left. If we lived that day by these settings. So today, everybody looks down at the building. We have problems with what we have today. And it stems from this time. In this area, mainly 150, 200 years removed, we got problems we're, we're, we're experiencing nowadays. Commodity era and survival efforts and disconnect. The Depression era and survival. This little lady out of the Navajo Nation painted this picture. Uh, Catherine Yazzie. She put it up, it got put in some publications, that kind of stuff. It's what she envisions of, of her elders and her people. She put this up. She put uh, the, the faces of the elders because you know what? We're broken. We, we, through, the, through these hard times, through these uh, bad ways of, of, of thinking about eating and, and being told what to eat, how to eat, where to eat, we're, we're losing our people. We're losing our people, and it's not from natural causes. We have shortened lifespans. Obesity, autoimmune diseases, shortened lifespan, poor quality of life, depressed mental state. Birth defects, increased alcohol, substance abuse, and broken circle of life. We cannot pass the knowledge on to our grandkids because we're not here. Our aunties and uncles can't come over and visit and play with us because they're missing a limb. They can barely get up out of their chairs. I know when I was eating terrible, my, my joints hurt really bad. I could barely move. And I've been a football player the majority of my life. And I was always pretty, pretty decently athletic. But when I, when I ate, the way I thought I was supposed to. Eat a lot of meat, you're a big boy, you're supposed to eat. I hurt, I was, I was literally hurting. Through all this right here, we're seeing, we're seeing that our, our lifespan, our quality of lives, they've they declined rapidly. My grandma and grandpa kicked off in their 60s, right? I'm almost there, what I gotta look forward to. That's a depressed state of mind, depressed state of thinking. 
What else do I live for? I'm already going to buy it when I'm 60 anyway. That's genetics. That's what they tell me. That's not true, right? Is that true? I, I, I hope not. But science is proving that when we get back to these wholesome foods, when we get back to the food that was grown for us, that, that people are yearning for now. They want these native seeds. They want these heirloom seeds. They want this food that we once had because it's had health benefits. But because of that depression era, because of what we were shown, what our ancestors had to fight through, what they had to, to live through, what they had to eat, this is, this, is, this is our outcome, and we're living it today. I'm glad there's parents in here. I'm glad there's grandmas. Because when you think about that, today, I, I put this word in the middle right here. It's called increased alcohol and substance abuse. Right? What does everybody think about when they say substance? Right? Absolutely not. Substance is what's preserving our food today. When you go get that bag of Cheetos, that's a substance. That makes you want it. That's an addiction. That creates addiction. You want that sweet. You want that salty. You want that flavor bill. That's a substance. It keeps you addicted. That's where we're at in mentality now. That's been something that we've been exposed to for the past 150 years. And to break that substance abuse, right now, I bet you one or two of you is probably like, man, there's no soda back here. What's these cheap guys? No, I'm just saying. I heard some comments. Wait, where's the fry bread? Wait a minute. I'm, I'm controversial. You guys can get after me later, right? I, I, I enjoy fry bread. I love seeing the memes. I love seeing all that fancy things going on with fry bread, right? My friend Chris right back here. Chris, what'd I say? <coughs> I don't even put you on the spot. You're a good talker, brother. What did, what did I tell you? <laughs> yeah, I'm eating some delicious soup, man. Good, beautiful bison three sister soup. He's like, what? Whoa, whoa, wait, where's the bread? So I had to go out of my way to eat fry bread, right? So I'm a good fry bread man. But we've glorified that. We've glorified our death sentence. We've glorified why grandma can make the best fry bread. We've glorified it. And it's the stepping stone to our downfall, right? Indian tacos, traditional native foods. And I, when I went to these tribal casinos and they said, Chef, we want tribal foods in these casinos. I'm going to hook you up with the lady down the road here in Sni. Anybody know where Sni is? Mohawk territory, across the Canadian border. Kind of rough, thuggish, roguish territory, right? Anyway, the Indian gentlemen don't care. So I want to hook you up with the lady down here. She makes the best fry bread. We want that in the casino. What? Oh, we're going to take you over to Grandma Luella's. She makes the best Mohawk cash. Oh, OK, now I'm intrigued. Let's find out what Mohawk cash is. I go there and serve it at funerals, at birthdays, at everything. It's mashed potatoes with country-style Jimmy Dean sausage gravy on top of it. <laughs> Excuse my language when I'm a kid. That's about shit on a shingle. <laughs> right, right? Anyway, that's, that's traditional. No, we're, we've lost our way, right? Finding these tribes, including the Quapaws, Quapaws had no idea what the traditional food was until I got there. I'll take you over to see Grandma. She got best fried bread. John Coke's corn, right? Corn soup, soup corn soup. Anyway, so this is uh, what we're finding out is what these foods, from the mother's perspective, and we're going to go into the mother's because the mother's crucial. It's very important. When you, as a mother, by the way, the only, only person that make the Lamoath to trust to carry a baby. I wouldn't trust myself. But you've been given the gift of, of birth, of life, of caring, of nurturing, using your body to create a life. We're finding out that what that woman puts in her body affects what that baby's brain develops on. When we're seeing these children come out today with ADHD, all these in, in, uh, problems, all these issues, these birth defects, mental disabilities, it's food related. It's what that woman was eating while she was on in, 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 in that delicate time. Did not give that baby the crucial nourishment as these traditional foods do to develop that strength and that mental capacity. And when that baby comes out, we put them right on formula. Another drug, right? That's a substance. Anybody see what's in formula? It's some terrible stuff, right? So from the womb to development, into those developmental years, Lacking this food, yeah. this nourishment, that child doesn't even have a chance. 
As parents, every time we drive our children through the drive through every time we got something we got to throw down their throats to get them fed, we're actually hurting our children. We're, I hate to say it, but we're, we're actually children. We're helping them move faster. And what we're seeing is without that proper food, without that nursery, without the brain development, depressed state set up. How many of you guys have been on reservations? I know most, some of you, most of you are from reservations. But if you've been on reservations, it's a totally different quality of life. There's some laughter, there's some fun, but deep underneath there's loss, there's depressed states, there's inner turmoil between families. There's, there's all these things of these small communities that are interconnected with keeping depressed states alive and well today. And when it comes time to eat, when it comes time to gather, when I go to some of the gatherings and stuff like that, there's chips out there, there's sandwiches out there, there's salads, like the high, you know, uh, what do you call it, sugary salads out there. And I'm like, what are we building a community off of this stuff for? Because it's easy to get, or was it, it's just people forgot the way they eat. Ding, 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 that's what it is. And then we go back farther and say, well, where do we get the food? Where can we go get this nutritious food that we're looking for, right? So, moving forward, those uh, substances and, and that depressed state of life, they run hand-in-hand -hand with suicides. They run hand-in-hand -hand with turmoil in the community, domestic violence, alcoholism. When you wake up in the morning, you want that soda? That sugar, C6, H2O6, right? I haven't been in chemistry since I was like, that's all. But that's what your body, your body wants it crazy. And once it breaks it down, you want more. And however you can get it, it's going to get it. You're, you're hardwired for salty, for sugary, or for fatty. And you're going to get it either way. So, this depression era and survival, we've been there. We saw it. We saw the detriment. We saw the boarding schools, right? Boarding schools wasn't any better for each and every one, so we're learning a lot about that too. So now, as we move past that stage, the sun's going to set on this era. It's setting on this era. We're learning. We're, we're craving. We're wanting. We're tired of being sick. We're tired of being uh, left without our elders. We're tired of uh, being left without our, our mothers and fathers to play with us. I, I chose this picture because I love the fact that there's three sisters on there and in the, in the plains here. There's a, there's a, there's a, a fourth figure and I, I put that towards the white buffalo cap. That's a healing process. They're there to watch this sunset. We're done with it. We've got to move on. We've got to get past that. Our ancestors sacrificed and created survival so we could be here today. They did that, not us. We can't carry that with us because they've already sacrificed for that. They've already lived and died for that. They lived through it. And now we've got to let that sun set and we've got to start new. And that's where we're at tonight. They tried to bury us, but they didn't know that we were seeds. I love that. <laughs> Put us through everything. Although this marking is for a missing emerging indigenous woman, that's even true for our ancestors. When they put us back into the earth, as John Trudell, even guys says, hey, we were seeds. We started that, that cycle again. We were able to be resilient when we last through that. And we can say our prayers, seven back, seven front, because they did that for us. And we're here. We're still here. Resurgence from resiliency, the new dawn. That woman holding that baby up to the sun. This is where we got to start. We got to be able to think and keep that mentality going. That that was paid for. Now we have the freedom to do what we need to do. We're not told what we have to eat anymore. We choose it. Our choices are not always the best. Those that are eating better are eating good. I, I commend you. It's, it's difficult work because everything we're saturated with is poison to our brain. Watching our favorite football match, watching our favorite softball match, pizza, burgers, beer, the good life. It's all there. It's, just, it's walking. It's amongst us. And that's a, that's a killer in itself. Wow, we got to do it. We got to get out of here. Uh, I could go on and on about this. I, I want to. I really do. Uh, but the new dawn, we're here. It's our choices. We get to create this life. 
Our three sisters are alive and well. We, we are growing these again. We have family veterans that are living this lifestyle. Every morning they wake up, they're in their fields. They're eating their foods. They're storing their foods. The picture in the middle is Dr. Becky uh, from Oneida up in Minnesota. She's beautiful. She wrote a lot of books on indigenous law. She just got a couple published. Those are her corn husk dolls. Her and her daughters made those from their crops. Every year, and she, does, she won't take money. She wants trade. She wants trade. She goes, that's not, that, that's not good to me. That money's not good to me. She goes, I, I want what I can use. And she buy me something from a garden. Come and trade. I'll do it. And our buffalo cap them. These are all that healing process that we have to capture. Those indigenous ways of thinking. We're here. Does anybody, anybody notice there's not one single man up there? I'm just saying, I'm not, I'm not mad bashing, but I will tell you, we were deeply rooted in the mother. We were deeply rooted in the mother's teachings and the nurturing, because that's where we came from. Anybody know, uh, amongst the Cherokee Nation, the clan mother, the head clan mother? She was the only one out of that whole village and her clan mothers that could determine if she was going to sacrifice her children. When it came time for conflict and battle, she would go out, she, out front of her lodge, there's a, there's a pole, and she would either paint it white for peace, or if she walked out in the middle of the village and she painted it red, she was willing to sacrifice her children. That's how important a mother is. How many women here know their role? That's, it's good to say, it's good to think about. But that's why it's, that's what's up there. <coughs> Free and free establish traditional food, family, and spiritual connection. We are no longer on those reservations, trapped in the given rations anymore. We get to choose, as I said before. There have been some positive things that have happened for the tribes, but it's constant. Vigilant fight about protecting what resources we have in terms of land and rights. John Trudeau, you know. Those pictures of those families gathering around that food, those are still done today. Many of the, the people, they, they pull all their harvest together. The family comes around and they distribute. Their, their, their food to the family members to take with them. It's a pride. It's uh, giveaways. It's, it's you giving everything you can to your communities to keep them going. Those children are all gathered. They got their bowls. They got everything. They come up and they're ready to go. They take that back to their camps and they prepare it. But on the right, it's another one of the Websters up in Oneida. They're living this. That's this year's crop of maple syrup. They just got finished with it last week. They ran the maple. That's their corn from last year's harvest. Those are sunflowers. I was right there looking at that and just in, in astonishment and wow. They're living it. They're, 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 they do not want money for that. Their efforts, they want trade. Bring them a, a leg of beef. Bring them something. They'll trade them. They converted their whole house. Their whole house on one side is a classroom for all the village to come learn how to do this. You see the little braid on top of the corn? That kind of good stuff. Beautiful. This is their farm. This is what they do. This is, this is two years worth of work. Two years worth of work. John Trudell, one of his lectures says, we're at that 11th hour, man. We're on a race to midnight. We're at the 11th hour. He said, it'll take two generations to get back to this. Two. That was back in 1998. Where are we today? What damage have we done through not living this way of life? They harvested rice this year. That's their rice over there. That's him on the canoe, and he actually made his own tools. First year he's ever rice. He got one little cup, but you know what? The rice wasn't very good this year. But at least he's doing it. He's living it. Down here at the bottom, all the seeds from uh, the corn from last year. Over there, they actually used the traditional utensils to pound their corn to be able to process the food. <coughs> They did buy a, a maple uh, syrup, uh, what do you call it, uh, reducer. He said, I'm not going to sit there all night. Man. <laughs> it's just me, he said. But that's him up in the corner. That guy I call brother, he, he, he made me realize that there's hope, that this is happening. And to him, I'm very grateful because I spent days upon his farm, working with him and seeing him in action, and just the, the, the glow on his face when he sees something. They got a little food lab over on the left there that they do. Anybody know this sous chef Sean Sherman? We've been doing this for 25 years. He comes along and gets a book. <laughs> I'm not jealous, I'm proud because he's put us on the map. He's allowed us to, to, to push something up and to be able to come alive. All those years I've been in those kitchens, I was the only native chef 
every native kitchen across the United States. I was the only native chef. My other natives were dishwashers. So, <laughs> still in the kitchen, no. But, uh, so anyway, they're living it. They're, they're absolutely living it, and I'm happy. It's very beautiful. Establishing healthy habits and behavior through travel thinking. This is the meal we did on our farm. This was their program, that was their program. That came out of the Great Lakes. That's their smoked fish out of the Great Lakes. Fantastic, right? So by creating these healthy habits, we're, we're allowing our families to, to be vibrant, to, to live, to sustain. We give them healthy habits. We give them something to look forward to, to be proud of who they are again, that self-worth, that community value. We get to build that again. We don't have to be depressed anymore. We have a choice. We have a way out. There's something to look forward to. <clears throat> I don't know if this is going to play. I'm hoping. So this is at, it's well after 11 o'clock. I got just a minute. Uh, hopefully it plays. Ah! We, we're almost out of time. Uh, if you guys want to watch that, it's actually on YouTube. But it is the, uh, it is the uh, 11th hour uh, speech. There's about two minutes clip that I took out of the whole thing. And it just talks about, she, she asked him the question, how are we going to uh, continue to sustain our way of life the way we are now? And, and he talks about it. it's got to be the change of way of thinking. It's got to be uh, your ability to understand that we wreak havoc upon this earth and to fill that in our body and our bones and our genetics and to try to, to push our way back to it. And that's, that's the truth. That's where we're at today. Finding that food. And anybody here eat this food and it just feels kind of heavy in your stomach? It feels like you actually ate something good, it's not like a cheeseburger. I, I see some eyes closed out there, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> happy, right? uh, if those of you that have the sugar problems, um, check for your blood sugar. I used all the maple syrup, I use it. It won't spike you. It's not going to spike you. It, it'll process the way it's supposed to because your body knows it. Your body understands it, okay? So, um, this was a great, great thing. I, I watched it, and I, and I hope that you guys can do it. We're running out of time. And then, uh, controversial, right? <laughs> Arlene's famous fry bread. 50, 100 endings and 50 pieces of fry bread, right? I chose this picture because she tore it in half, and I said, fry bread is dead. And I said that to Chris. And he got a sad look on his face. <laughs> I truly believe, believe there's a place for it. It commemorates something that our ancestors lived through. It's something that they do understand has become part of our culture. But we don't need to keep glorifying something to our children and telling our people that fry bread, because every time I get approached in a setting, well, where's the fry bread? <coughs> when I was in a casino cooking 30, $35 lobster tails, where's the fry bread? I thought this was a native casino. I, I really wanted to take that lobster tail and eat. <laughs> I know I'm serious though, but I mean, really, we got to change the way we think. We got to think about all these things we talked about today: finding connectivity, getting back to where we are, creating wholesome lifestyles again, breaking that broken cycle, breaking that cycle, and, and creating. Uh, I wish you guys would do that for me. <laughs> creating that lifestyle and getting past that depressed state of mind. Um, where we go. It's great to be a good cook, and it's great to be um, an influence on many people when it comes to palates and, and learning. But we also need to understand that we had something. We had a connectivity. We sang songs for our food. We commemorated it. We lived it. These families are living it today, and it's out there. Facebook is one of the greatest avenues you can find right now with seed savers, with individuals that are doing this lifestyle. And most of them want trade. Most of them want to be rewarded for their work. That's their community work and their self-worth. All right, any uh, quick questions? I have a Facebook post. I haven't sent the $12 for a domain. But you know it's going to have to do this. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we got, we got a, um, a lot more that I didn't get to discuss tonight. It's 8 o'clock, and I know many of us are past bedtime, many of us are sitting over the full stomach. Where was that farm again? Uh, that was up at Ukwahi Farms. That's in uh, right south of Green Bay, okay. Wisconsin there. 
So on, they're on Facebook, uh, the Webster, Stephen and uh, Becky Webster, she's actually a lawyer. She's trying to fight for tribal rights on the Oneida Reservation up there, doing a fantastic job. Uh, my contact information, uh, I do have cards also if you guys want some. Um, that way you can contact me, we can start some discussions and we can get this platform delivered because there's probably about 16 more hours I didn't get to talk about. <laughs> and generalizing is this.